Welcome to this webinar on the post Modi visit to Washington DC. Uh, I'd like to introduce my two colleagues here, uh, Brendan Banner of the US India Business Council, Senior Manager, good morning. morning, and Michael Green, Director of Client and Stakeholder Relations at SanMS4. Uh, the last few weeks have been particularly busy here, and not only did the Prime Minister of India uh, visit DC for the week, uh, SanMS4 was very proud to launch its new US headquarters in Washington DC at the beginning of the week last week and uh, certainly the turnout for that from the international business community, particularly the India business community related to the US, uh, was a really positive sign for us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the impact of Prime Minister Modi's visit. It was his third uh, official bilateral discussion with President Obama in the two years that Prime Minister Modi has been in office. And uh, we're going to be talking about the impact on real business opportunities between the US and India. At SANMS4, we often get asked leading up to these uh, high level visits what are the relevance to, to businesses on the ground, where are the opportunities, and how do people actually access the opportunities that come out of such initiatives. So, today we hope to cover the highlights of that. Um, but first and foremost, I'd like to introduce Brandon Banner and uh, ask him to talk a little bit about the US India Business Council what they do and um, to, to put the last week into context because I know you had a major role uh, in last week by hosting Prime Minister Modi for dinner at your leadership summit. Well thanks Adrian and thanks to everybody out there for, for joining us uh, this morning or this evening depending on if you're in, in the US or India. Uh, for those of you who don't know USIBC is a bilateral policy advocacy organization focused on advancing US and India commercial ties uh, we represent 350 companies, both from India and the U.S., uh, across all sectors in the, in the U.S.-India commercial economy. Um, as Adrian mentioned, uh, USIBC had the opportunity to host uh, the Prime Minister again during his trip here in, in Washington last week. Uh, well, for me, what was, what was particularly significant, and I, I've, I've seen these events, uh, so I've been here with the Council since the Prime Minister came, uh, was elected in 2014 is is actually the um, there was actually a higher enthusiasm for the prime minister's uh, trip this year uh, this trip than than I've seen in the past um, and that's both uh, represented in, in the, the interest of companies but also in uh, the interest of this the high level uh, representatives from those companies uh, everyone from CEOs of fortune 500 companies uh, much higher interest from international organizations. Um, we had a, a much higher uh, interest from the Indian diaspora and, and key players here in the U.S. government. So um, from that aspect, it's really telling to see uh, that two years into the prime minister's term uh, as prime minister of India that we're seeing uh, increasing, uh, ever-increasing enthusiasm. During our event last week, we had uh, over 500 people, and that included uh, 15 members of Congress, uh, several cabinet officials, and 25 Fortune 500 CEOs in attendance. Um, I think this is a, a reflection on the fact that the commercial relationship is growing ever stronger. Uh, India is clearly a, a global bright spot in the in the global economic landscape, um, and and it's just being uh, that's just a demonstration of of how the relationship is moving forward. Uh, our event went very well. We awarded uh, Jeff Bezos from, from Amazon and Dilip Sangui from Sun Pharmaceuticals with, with um, Global Leadership Awards to, to uh, signify their dedication to the U.S.-India relationship. And I think from the, from the business and commercial highlights, the, the certainly most significant announcement we saw was, uh, of course, as many of you must have seen in the news, uh, Mr. Bezos' announcement of an additional $3 billion investment in India over the next few years. So um, I think India is clearly open for business and the U.S.-India uh, relationship is growing ever stronger. Thank you, Brendan. I've been to a number of your events and I was certainly impressed by the breadth and depth of people that attended this one. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, a number of the congressmen uh, uh, attended and I think mm -hmm. that was uh, the precursor to the Prime Minister speaking to the uh, joint session the following day, which was, which was a you know, trem tremendous um, uh, step, I think, in the relationship. But also at the event, I noticed a, a much wider plethora of interest from smaller mid-market companies and you know, an, an expansion of the interest 
uh, much more widely. Fantastic to see a significant and major investment from Amazon announced at your mm-hmm. event. Three billion, I think, is on top of two billion that yeah. has already been announced. So that's five billion dollars of investment. Amazon, a very strong US-based company, huge amounts of uh, supply chain partners in uh, the US, of course. Michael, uh, you've been involved in a number of these events. When you see an announcement like that from Amazon at the beginning of the week and they throw it out and they say, you know, we believe in the market as, as Jeff Bezos did. He said, you know, we, it's our fastest growing market. We think India's got the potential to be our greatest market. What does that say about the real opportunities for U.S. companies and organizations who are looking at um, India now and saying, well, you know, what is there in that, what is there in that for the market for us? Well, I think it, uh, th- thank you, Adrian. I think a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, companies around the globe are looking at India uh, in terms of a growth opportunity. Um, with China uh, slowing down a bit, India has only continued to uh, increase in terms of GD- GDP and really has a ways to grow um, kind of overall. Um, with, with, you know, Amazon, we'll get to Westinghouse in a little bit, with these companies entering the market, I think it, it, it's a signal for, for their supply chain, for, um, you know, the small mid-market companies to really uh, look at this as an opportunity to, I don't want to say ride, ride the coattails of these companies, but oftentimes a lot of the nuts and bolts of the policies that make it easier for companies to do business in a market like India are smoothed over with the entry of these very large investments. Well, I think I'm going to pick up on your point there, riding the coattails of these opportunities. I mean, certainly the US IBC has been well known for representing the interests of the very largest US corporations, but increasingly so, your your uh, backing initiatives support the smaller and medium-sized companies in the supply chain. Of course, you've supported some of the own initiative with the U.S. business centers, uh, which was prompted by Secretary Kerry at Vibrant Gujarat uh, at one of your events last year. Um, I, I want us to, to now discuss some of those big ticket items and what they mean to actually the smaller and medium-sized companies and the, and the wider community. And of course, smaller and medium-sized companies in the U.S. you know, encompasses some pretty large businesses here. Um, First and foremost, one of the major initiatives that we saw, Michael, you touched on it, was the um, uh, MOU that was signed between Westinghouse and the Nuclear Power Corporation of India. This has been a a deal that's been on the table for for, for almost a decade now. It's reached in its very final stages. They're now saying that contractual terms are being finalized and they're going to be concluded by 2017. They have actually agreed, I believe, according to the joint statement from both governments, to, to begin breaking ground. Engineering designs have started. Brandon, this is a, a major, major US India deal. It's six nuclear reactors. It's one of America's greatest corporations going into India, delivering what it does best. What do you see the significance of this particular stage of the discussion in terms of you know the wider opportunity between US and India business? Mm-hmm. I think it's a clear it's a clear demonstration that there's commitment from both sides. I think that, as you mentioned, this has been a deal that's been going on for a decade now, and and uh, you can't expect a deal like that to just come together in one go. Uh, this is very clearly a, a significant move forward. Um, it's obviously a very complicated deal. There are a lot of players. There are a lot of uh, positions and stakeholders, and so it's really positive to see that there are some concrete outcomes that, that both sides are moving forward. And I think um, at, this, at this time, it's, it's, it's clear that it's moving forward, but it's gonna, take, it's gonna take some time. Great, thanks. One of the things we're particularly focused on, Michael, with our US business census initiative is getting behind these big deals and making sure that the supply chain can uh, get themselves ready. What uh, advice have you got for the supply chain of Westinghouse to be considering doing now that this deal is at, at, at the final stages. Right. So I, I think I think the first thing is to have a global context of what the supply chain means. Um, for you know a, a deal of this proportion, you're going to have companies from from Germany, from Japan, from all across uh, all across the globe competing. Um, Competing in the uh, 
uh, for bids to be a part of this project. So uh, for U.S. companies, uh, some of them, the market, I think what I've realized is that the U.S. market is so large. For, for a Pennsylvania company to be doing business in California, they almost feel global. But for a U.K. company, or for you know, UK is an island, Japan's an island. They're almost forced to be global at the outset in order to grow. Um, so it's really for the US companies to see these big global announcements and then want to kind of plug into, um, you know, plug into the opportunity. And for that, you know, to do that, you have to understand the markets, uh, understand India, understand China, understand Brazil, understand these uh, uh, the developing markets around the globe that you know many of the fortune 500 companies are now looking to for growth because frankly the the u.s market is still the largest market in terms of you know consumer market but um, the prospects for growth at the um, levels that we're seeing in in india and elsewhere um, you know don't match up I think one of the things that, that, that I always try to, to remind people of is that when you see the big announcements, whether it be from uh, Boeing or Ford or Westinghouse, you know, behind them are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of you know, suppliers, as you say, from all over the world, but particularly the US. And I think it's particularly important at this stage now that US companies are putting their best foot forward. For every American supplier, there's probably a German supplier or a Japanese supplier, and they really need to you know, take that initiative. I mean, one of the interesting things that we were discussing prior to uh, this session starting was just looking at the register of attendees. Yeah, there are companies from over a dozen states uh, in across the US um, of America and right across you know, the four corners. And I think we we're really impressed by the, the, the depth of um, not only the geographic spread, but also yeah. the size of those companies um, yeah. that, are, that, that are certainly dialing in and paying interest now. Um, so, big opportunity in the Westinghouse supply chain. We'll all be watching that very closely. US IBC, I know, will be um, you know, tracking that very, very closely and, and, and will have a role to play as, as, as that deal develops uh, your own membership base. Yeah. Um, the, the other really big announcement which I saw, which I thought does have relevance to, to U.S. organizations and should be taken very seriously, is in the um, renew, renewable energy space, particularly in um, uh, clean energy around solar. Um, I think we saw three major announcements um, last week by the two heads of state. We saw uh, a $20 million fund um, to kick off some, some financing initiatives, particularly around um, the the um, electrification of rural villages in India. Um, uh, another $40 million um, committed between the two countries in um, small, set, small scale technologies that will help um, solar power in renewable, um, uh, renewable projects across, again, rural India, making sure that um, people have access to, uh, to, to, to electricity across the country. And then a $30 million fund, which is very much focused on um, the R&D around um, off-grid um, uh, power storage and, uh, and the emergence of new technologies that have a particular relevance to India. And I think that came out of the uh, COP21 summit in Paris recently. These small, um, relatively small financial commitments, $20 million, $30 million, $40 million, have a much bigger impact on kick-starting the, um, the, 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 the uh, access to energy for, for um, rural villages in particular in India. What is the significance of some of these statements? That, you know, do they have an impact? Is it, is it getting to a stage where people in the US who are involved in the solar industry above and beyond the great work that people like the IFC and, and USAID and others are doing? Is it now time for suppliers and manufacturers and consultants involved in the space to really be grasping their hands around this opportunity, Brandon? Absolutely. I think that, that it's, it's a clear, this is a clear positive uh, for both sides. I think that, that the fact that there's, there's actually money behind some of these agreements is, is really when you, when you start seeing progress. The, um, you know, it's, it's difficult enough to come to an agreement, whether it's the Paris uh, Agreement, which was achieved uh, last year, or um, uh, whether it's agreement on how to move forward with smart city projects or um, other renewable projects. Really, the focus 
um, tends to be on the agreement to move forward, but really it's, it comes down to, uh, from the commercial side, really the, it comes down to the money and, and having financing and the ability for companies to have a place to go to, to plug into an, uh, <clears throat> to a financial pipeline. Uh, that's a really key, uh, a really key indicator that things are moving forward. So this is a very clear, clear positive, um, and I think a, a, a resounding uh, positive movement for the for the U.S. India relationship. And at the U.S. India Business Council, you have a number of sector leads um, who are looking after various areas: renewable, yep. defense, uh, and bio, pharma. Yep. You have a dedicated you know, desk that looks after yep. clean energy. And what, what kind of work will they be involved in on day to day? So, so they were. Uh, if, so we do have a desk, as as Adrian mentioned, focused on on virtually every sector. Uh, in the economy and and um, the team that focuses on on energy and renewable energy increasingly is is taking up their agenda uh, has been involved in this since the beginning so really pushing for uh, the financing piece and, and trying to make sure that, that both countries are aligned when it comes to uh, priorities and clean energy and and how to move it forward right you mentioned smart cities uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll move on to that uh, mm -hmm. as a next topic point if we may um, U.S. IBC have been particularly uh, involved in smart mm -hmm. cities agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that aren't aware, the Indian government has pledged uh, to create 100 smart cities uh, over the next decade, which is an enormous undertaking, uh, and this will require contributions from companies across the world, whether they're infrastructure, service provision, skills and training, design, you name it. I mean, there's monumental sums of investment going into these projects. The U.S. has agreed to partner on a number of these cities, and I think the U.S. IBC is actually playing a lead in that smart city initiative, and, and there are some really genuine opportunities there for, for, for U.S. companies. Can you kind of summarize the work that you're doing, and you know, how do people start getting involved in putting their name forward to participate in some of these developments? Yeah, I mean, the, the smart cities ultimately comes down to a real, genuine, multi-stakeholder approach. Um, there's, there's the U.S. government has definitely played a leadership role. The Indian government is very clearly um, trying to push forward smart cities movement. U.S. IBC has been there uh, since the announcement of the 100 smart cities uh, program. We just re recently announced a, a renewed and reinvigorated effort towards um, Allahabad specifically um, in, in developing the smart cities. And really, that comes down to um, you, there's there is a need for public funding. Certainly, um, we're talking about in, in infrastructure development here. We're talking about master planning. Those things really require a, a front-end investment um, that we've we've seen in bits and starts, but haven't gotten uh, as much as uh, certainly as as you could need, as one could wish for. Um, but it's definitely moving forward. I know companies all the way from the technology space uh, to the energy space and, and infrastructure development space are all very interested in in how this is going to move forward and finding ways to plug in. And so there really is a robust dialogue around smart city development. And I think it's something that will be a pretty big uh, priority for both governments for the years to come. And, and what I've seen in the past couple of years, Brandon, is that at the US IBC, you, you, you gather a number of these companies who have an interest either by a particular sector, as you say, with IT mm -hmm. or training or, or engineering or, or, or infrastructure uh, development. And you've been hosting a number of delegations yep. uh, in some of those cities. You've been taking them out into the field. You've been introducing them to some of the local state authorities, trying to match them up with, yep. with local partners there. So it's been quite a big uh, uh, initiative for the U.S. Indian yep. Business Council over the past couple of years, hasn't it? And, and Matt, it's, it's very similar to, to the kind of uh, governments we see in the U.S. as well, where, you know, a delegation to really have meaningful interactions, you've got to be talking to people, uh, government officials at the center and state and, and local level. And so it really does take a lot of coordination from uh, from within the government of India, as well as from from the private sector side, and and as I said, the you know the U.S. government has played a, a key role as well. Um, it's definitely been a, a big effort in the past couple of years. Right. And uh, certainly, when you're considering building a, a city from the ground up, you know those are monumental uh, infrastructure developments. You, you you then realize everything that needs to go into it from. Uh, uh, you know, traffic lights, the roads, to the technology, mm -hmm. to, the, to the buildings. Um, Michael, where do you see the Smart City Initiative going? Is it you know, an opportunity that's accessible to most uh, U.S. corporations, small, medium, and large? And uh, you know, how would they engage with that uh, opportunity? 
Yeah, so I think another thing to add and something that I know the US IBC has been um, very active in is a lot of the Indian states have been traveling also to the US. And so they've been doing road shows all across the country with local uh, representatives from uh, you know cities across the country that they see as a model to build out their smart cities. Uh, so in terms of the accessibility, I don't think I've ever seen it. I've never seen the Indian government this accessible, and I've never seen the, you know, on both sides. Them traveling to the U.S., I think USTDA supported a reverse trade mission that they did, uh, I think, in February. And then um, also on the U.S. corporate side, you know, putting together missions at, at, at this stage, at the early stage that India is really kind of developing its cities, uh, as Adrian said, from an infrastructure perspective, um, uh, timing really couldn't get better because a lot of these things are at the very beginning stages in terms of these initiatives. India often gets compared to China and, and the development cycle and India following it by 20, 30 years or whatever. Um, duration you believe that India's got to catch up uh, its neighbor. One of the things that I've seen in China over the last 20 or so years that I've been involved in the country is a lot of the foreign success stories there, the companies that have really done well, the, the skills training providers that are coming from overseas, they really succeeded on the back of this major infrastructure development. There's huge amounts of capital is deployed, huge amounts of energy and initiatives going in and there's just so much going on that frankly there's you know, more than enough for, for everyone to participate in. I think one of the exciting things that, that, that I'm seeing now is what's been I guess two or three years of discussions about the Smart City Initiative certainly under Modi as you know, rumours of Smart City development prior to his inauguration but he's really captured the imagination of, of the states and got them to compete through this competitive federalism now which is really making them want to develop the best cities and the most attractive cities for locals and for foreign investors to come in and um, it really now feels to me is if that rhetoric and the planning and the discussions is starting to turn into to, a tangible opportunity that soon American companies and organizations and institutions are really going to be able to just grasp with two hands. Do you, do you both get that feeling or do you think there's still some way to go before it you know, becomes uh, tangible? So real quick on that, I think it was really interesting when USIBC hosted uh, Narendra Modi in 2014, um, the speech that he delivered then, the speech that he delivered uh, last week, the vision has been consistent throughout, whether it's smart cities, whether it's Make in India, whether it's Digital India, uh, he has created kind of a platform for all of the companies, you know, all of the state governments to kind of rally behind and plug into. So I think that's been an extremely positive development. And then, um, you know, on your point in terms of the competitive federalism, um, I don't think you see it, uh, as, as clear as you do in uh, the city of Hyderabad, which is right now uh, the, the shared capital of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So uh, last year I was on a mission with um, pharma healthcare companies, pharmaceutical companies, and uh, we spoke with the Andhra Pradesh government and they said, you know, we'll get, we'll get clearance. We just passed a bill that any clearances will come across in 14 days. We went over and spoke to the Telangana government and they said they do it in 10. So you can see that there is this, this very high level of competition across all the states. And, um, you know, I, I do think the Modi government has played a huge role in that. And the consistency that he's been able to drive these initiatives is really where, you know, how you can see results. Because India can oftentimes become a bit of a schizophrenic place um, politically, um, and now with this, you know, clear vision, this consistent leadership, I think you're seeing a lot of money follow it because that's what businesses need: is the consistency, the certainty, and the predictability of the market. Yeah, and I think that's what's drawing the attention from a wider community in the U.S. Now, it's not just those who, like us, are, are, are long-term believers in the India story, yeah. but those who are actually seeing, you know, consistency at ground 
roots level. I mean, I yeah. certainly feel that there are still some challenges and there are still some idiosyncrasies that get thrown up that we're all having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But we certainly see through the process that we go by bringing uh, US corporations and universities into the country that it's become easier for us to do that and easier for them to operate. Um, certainly the competitive federalism that Michael was talking about has really aided the ease of doing business challenge that Prime Minister Modi has set because now you've got everyone or certainly a large number of the states trying to compete with each other and it's certainly something that, that you guys are focused on. Uh, I was on a, a panel discussion with the World Bank uh, last week who obviously managed the ease of doing business uh, survey. But Brandon, from, from where you see and what your members are saying, is it becoming easier to do business in India already under two years under, under Modi? Are there signs of that happening? Or, you know, is there still a long way to go? What, what's the view of your members? I, I think it's both. I mean, there's clearly, uh, the, real, the real positive here is that the Prime Minister was clearly elected on a, on a pro-jobs, pro pro-growth, pro-economy uh, uh, platform, and he's absolutely been sticking to that since, since being elected. And, and one positive sign has been, you know, in, in the past we've seen um, governments that, that don't do well on the ease of doing business index tend to shy away from it and say, uh, you know, try to argue with the methodology or, or um, try to demonstrate in other ways that they're, that they're a, a, an outlier in, in, the, in the equation. However, uh, the prime minister has really embraced it and, in fact, expanded it to, um, you know, empower uh, a central agency, Niti to to go out and, and implement an ease of doing business survey throughout the states. So you have the states actually having a, a real metric by which um, you can look and see how each state is doing against one another uh, within India. So the competitive federalism is certainly on. Um, governments uh, from states across India are making their way around the world, trying to showcase um, what industries and what, what value they add to the, to the global economy and to the Indian economy. Uh, so we're definitely seeing positive movement there. And I think, you know, talking to, to member companies and, and executives at, at some of the large companies, at least, you certainly, uh, there's an increase of people citing discussions on India in the boardroom um, in areas where you really expect um, decisions to be made. So whether uh, those result in investment or not, it's uh, case by case. It's certainly um, trending upwards in, in a big way. Um, but the fact that the conversations are happening, the fact that um, the people that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are coming to me and saying, you know, what, what do I need to know? What are things, how are things advancing? Um, that's a real positive sign in and of itself. Great, thank you. So a lot of people, you know, say to, say to me, leading up to the event, you know, what does it mean? Why are you all running around so much? And there's a lot of running around um, previous visits and during and, and after. Um, and I was trying to refer it to you know, any kind of strategic partnership that, that a company is trying to engage in or a university is trying to engage in. And relationships are not built by single visits, by single meetings. The leaders of those organizations have to get to know each other. The professors have to like each other if they're going to do collaborative research. Uh, and then there's a developing of ties amongst the senior managers, the senior executive, and the people who have got to implement these programs. And I think you know, what we're seeing as part of this Modi-Obama special relationship is the strengthening and deepening of the ties. And you see that in their body language when they're together, and certainly um, you know, all of the um, photography that uh, gets circulated around the world, it, it, it shows a real... Um, uh, mutual respect for each other. So I think you know the, the, the fact that it's their third formal bilateral uh, discussion, the fact that they meet each other on the fringes of things like um, COP21 summit at Paris, the fact that they met each other at the UN in New York recently, uh, and uh, the fact that there's going to be a strategic commercial dialogue, I believe, uh, at the end of August between the two governments. Yeah, these are all part of the fabric which is now coming together after you know many years, I guess, of, of really a, a, a rather um, uh, tepid relationship, I, I guess it could be described that. Um, one of the other major initiatives that both um, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi announced last week was further collaboration in the area of travel and tourism. Uh, so they made a joint, in the joint statement, they announced that uh, the US and India will be travel and tourism partners for 2017. And at the same time, there was a commitment to finalize the uh, access for Indians to uh, access the Global Entry Program, which will cut down the 
uh, entry procedures significantly for Indians. The visa regime uh, in the US certainly seems to be increasingly favorable for, um, uh, for, uh, for, for joint uh, visits, both from, from US business visas. I know we're issued here for five to ten years, whereas in Europe it's quite difficult to get longer than a couple of years most of the time. Um, we're seeing a significant increase in um, student traffic now, I think up 29% last year, 133,000 new students from India uh, coming into the US, which Michael, I'll come on to ask you a little bit about. But Brandon, when you, when you see announcements on the travel and tourism area and you see the commitment to improving um, free travel between the two countries, what does that say to you and what does that mean for, for the average business that's trying to uh, you know, either do business in India or Indians coming to do business here in the US? Uh, this is really just a, a greasing the wheels type of exercise. So you see the government's really trying to create um, the, the ability for co companies to do business with each other uh, across the borders. And that's, it's really just a, a matter of, of trying to facilitate greater uh, collaboration between the two uh, economies try to make it easier for executives to get back and forth for, for people who are trying to you know, scope the Indian market or for Indian companies trying to scope the U.S. market, make it easier for them to get here, make it easier for them to, to travel around. That's, it's really important. It, doesn't, it often isn't a huge headline-busting um, issue, but the Global Entry Program will be very, very welcomed by certain companies. And then um, the same thing goes for the announcement on, on additional, having an additional consulate in both countries. So I know we, we're going to be having, uh, here in the U.S., we'll, we'll be having a new consulate, Indian consulate in Seattle, which will definitely be very welcome. And, and uh, in India, there will be a new uh, U.S. consulate. I think I don't think they've announced exactly where that will be yet. Um, but these are those are very positive, always having, you know, it's always a positive movement to have another touch point uh, with the government of India and, and with the U.S. government here. Um, and then the last piece that, again, is not, uh, we have a long way to go on this, but I'm glad to see the totalization is still in um, making its way onto the agenda. It's a really important issue. Um, we as council are, are very supportive of, of advancing talks on, on totalization, recognizing it is a challenging uh, issue. It's something that isn't going to be resolved in the next couple of weeks or months, um, but we definitely uh, find it positive that they're still talking about it. Thanks, Brandon. In a week's time, uh, we at Sunrise Forum will be attending the Select USA Summit in uh, Washington, D.C. This is the um, largest, I suppose, of all events annually for the Department of Commerce to drive interest uh, into the U.S. from an inward investment perspective. Michael, when you see initiatives around the, the, the visa liberalization uh, as far as Indians are concerned coming into to the U.S., uh, and you see the increased interest from student activity, where are the opportunities, first and foremost, for the states within the United States? You know, they, they have a healthy uh, competitive federalism amongst themselves, don't they, whether it be for tourism or investment. Um, what should those states be considering now as, as there's greater access to, the, to both markets? Yeah, so I think uh, in the past, you know, a decade or so ago, the, most, the, the states that were on the front end of engagement with markets like India would have their governor visit, they'd, you know, their, their, their staff would do some advance work. But I think now what you're seeing is a continued engagement in the market from uh, states at various levels within their economic development groups, uh, having folks, representatives uh, on the ground permanently uh, to raise the flag to say, you know, come do business in Ohio, come do business in uh, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Arizona, um, you're seeing that and I think you're seeing a subsection of that when, when it, uh, when it, with regard to tourism. Um, so a lot of the DMOs are developing and uh, employing resources on the ground uh, in India to get um, you know more more tourists from that market to the US. Uh, right now, you see very healthy numbers going uh, at least from India into the US, but it hasn't really been uh, structured in a way. And I think you're seeing the same thing on the higher education side. Uh, most uh, higher education institutions have been working very closely with uh, uh, agency networks, um, but uh, until the last you know, 
five years, decade or so, you're seeing uh, universities really try to, you know, wrap their arms around uh, their engagement with with the Indian market in particular, whether whether it's with regard to partnerships or you know enrollment. We see at Sanomis for a, a, a broad number of um, approaches taken by governments around the world to embrace India in particular in their uh, economic, political, and, and social affairs, I guess. Uh, and certainly what I'm seeing in the US is that there's a multi-pronged approach. You know, it's on travel and tourism on one side, mm -hmm. on business and economics on the other, on student um, uh, study abroad programs from the US going into India and 133,000 students that are coming here everywhere are, you know, populating some of the um, uh, you know, best companies in the world once they graduate here and are helping create some of those uh, yeah. companies or many of those companies. In fact, uh, I really see a, you know, a, a broad-based approach and I think all of those are fairly interrelated. You know, when a parent comes across drop their, you know, their, their, their children off at university here, they go on an extended trip, they consider buying real estate, they become familiar with the country, and many of those uh, Indian parents have you know, set up businesses here or invested businesses here. So it's all part of that really important fab fabric, which I think the relationship um, is, you know, is certainly moving forward on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's the people-to-people -people connections that have really driven uh, the U.S.-India relationship, and I think that's why the Indian diaspora is so energized right now because they're actually seeing the realization of um, you know all the efforts that have been put in, and they're seeing it being supported. I think on both the U from the U.S. government side and the Indian government side um, to really you know push forward on you know initiatives that are gonna bring more students back and forth between the two countries, bring more tourists and and business. Yeah, well, last, last week I had the privilege of being given a behind the scenes tour of the Smithsonian here in Washington, D.C. with some Indian guests of ours. And uh, we were talking about uh, you know, the, 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 the transfer of um, mutual uh, tourists from, from India to the U.S. and the U.S. to India to, to visit various respective monuments, whether it's the, the Americans going over to see the Taj and the wonders of Rajasthan and the Himalayas and so on, and certainly encouraging more uh, Indians as passage of uh, movement becomes easier into uh, particularly D.C. and I'm sure many other states are, are waking up to that and attracting people to their areas of natural beauty and, and uh, tourist destinations and theme resorts and, and so on. I think there's a really big opportunity there and. Um, Hopefully we'll see the airlines uh, implementing some new direct routes. I'm sure we'd uh, we'd all be glad to see that uh, some of us will in the US. I would say it'd be good to have a DC route. It would be good to have a DC <laughs> route. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've got a few questions already coming through. Um, please do feel free to uh, enter them in the, in the chat box on your screen. Uh, I'm going to pick up on one of these questions, which uh, I'm going to uh, level to you first, Brando. Um, We've talked about some of the specific areas where we see progress being made and opportunities are likely to arise out of that. Significant opportunities in some cases, smart cities, the, the Westinghouse deal, um, the clean energy space. Um, how nervous should US companies be about going in there? The question is, you know, what is the real operating environment like in India now? Has it changed in the last few years? And you know, should I have the confidence now to, to, to be taking a serious look at India when I've you know, been doing business elsewhere in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't think I think the numbers are telling the, the truth on that one. There's there's a real clear movement in the positive direction of companies uh, investing in India, spending the time to to really understand the Indian market and and actually uh, you know take a, a, a unique approach to how they're going to do business in India, recognizing um, that it is a, a unique destination. Uh, to do business. Um, I think that certainly uh, the, the U.S. Uh, India Business Council has seen our members um, increasing investment. It's very rare at th this stage to see um, companies, you know, pulling out of India or reducing their investment like we did see um, in years past. So I think it's certainly a positive uh, movement. I think companies uh, that aren't considering India should be looking at India. Um, the global economy is, is changing. Uh, the sharing economy is a, is a very significant um, transformation that we've seen over the past couple of years. That's that's really changed the way that people can do business both in India and around the world. But but India uh, seems to be embracing it very well. So I think 
Um, in general, companies are, are positive on India. Uh, the Fortune 500 seems to be quite positive, and I think with that, as you mentioned, um, the small and medium enterprises will certainly follow. Picking up on that point, um, uh, Brandon, you mentioned the small and medium-sized enterprises. In February, we announced the opening of our first U.S. business centers in India, an initiative we've been working on with the council for, for over a year, with the support from Citibank and James Lang LaSalle and uh, the Taj Hotel and Resorts Group. Michael, you're going to be playing a key role in bringing companies into India from the U.S., bringing institutions, universities in particular, into the U.S. and providing them this environment from which they can flourish. Do you want to give us a, a, a brief overview of, of the type of support services that are being made available and maybe talk about some of the work that we're doing with our partners such that people who are here on the webinar can have more confidence about going into India and um, dipping their toe in the water and, and trying to participate in the growth story there. Sure, sounds good. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Sanam S4, I mean, essentially it, it's a it's a soup to nuts uh, platform for uh, small, medium-sized businesses, higher education institutions to be able to assess the market and then enter the market. Um, I had uh, been with Brandon and U.S. India Business Council for uh, uh, over four years before joining Adrian and his team, and uh, I'm really excited to be working on these, uh, you know, the real nuts and bolts of how do we hire our first employee? How do we, what, what, what structure should we um, choose for the Indian market? How do we move our capital in and out of the country? Um, some of these nuts and bolts questions that need to be um, answered are what, you know, is what Sanam S4 um, can help advise on. And we have uh, over 120 um, employees and team members uh, based in India across five locations. Uh, so a, a really strong understanding of the market. Um, a lot of the, uh, from everything from the initial market research to understand if you're, you know, what, what the price point is for your product in the Indian market, if that makes sense for your company, um, all the way through to, you know, some of the accounting work, the payroll, like I said, the, the, the hiring and the HR advisory. So it's really this, this, this broad understanding of what your business's objectives are, how do you accomplish them in a market like India, and handling all of that work in-house so that your team back in headquarters, um, you know, can folk, you know, is usually usually our main points of contact within these companies are looking at, at the entire globe. So they have responsibilities of all of international. So what Sanam S4 does is is really kind of simplifies um, the communication and uh, bridges any communication gaps that um, you know whether they're universities, nonprofits, or companies. Um, you know, and, and, and between going between the U.S. and, and India. So that's, that's really how I see the role of, of Sanam S4 and, you know, since joining have, have traveled with you, Adrian, have traveled with our CFO, Kapil Dua, up to Boston, out to Chicago, met with current clients, and um, it's really amazing. The, the way that the meetings go with some of our clients is you'll, you'll, you'll have the payroll team come in, then you'll have the HR team come in, then you'll have the uh, legal team come in, then you'll have the um, uh, operations team come in to kind of get a broader understanding of really what's happening with the company there and where the company is choosing to go going forward. Um, so that's really how I see it. The team, team working very hard and uh, certainly yeah. an increase in interest from other factors since the US business centers were launched. Uh, Brandon, Jeff Bezos talked uh, at your leadership summit about his investment in the country, uh, additional $3 billion uh, on top of his $2 billion he pledged uh, within the last two years. Uh, he talked about some specific stories of uh, some Indian small entrepreneurs who were manufacturers, I think a leather jacket um, producer mm -hmm. and a lady that was producing um, uh, children's uh, furniture and goods. Um, and uh, he was talking about the skills uh, in, in, in India related to manufacturing. Now, making India has received huge amounts of publicity around the world, and it's a really well-known campaign now. You see it in billboards internationally. 
you lead on the manufacturing um, space in the US and the US India Business Council. There's some sensitivity that India is about to take jobs away from the US. And my view on that is, well, if that would have happened, China would have done that already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, this is not about that. But from where the US and India Business Council sits, what are the opportunity for US manufacturers engaging with India? Is it just to outsource our jobs or is it about let's establish a local presence, first and foremost sell our products there and we know that there's a lot of demand for American quality products and services and maybe people can kind of use that as a springboard to then sell it to the region? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, what we've really focused on is, is expanding that, you know, the Make in India initiative has been huge across <clears throat> around the world. Um, it, like you said, billboard style, television commercials on the Sunday shows here in D.C. I mean, it's a, it's a very big bang uh, campaign. Um, we, we've expanded that phrase just a little bit and say um, we absolutely support Make in India, and particularly we support Make in India for the world. So um, just expanding the focus and say, um, that this, this, this initiative should be about integrating India into the global supply chain, um, creating a, a, a new place in Asia, uh, a new a bright spot in Asia for companies to, to enhance their value chain and to create products not only in India for India, but also in India for the rest of the world. And when you start to see companies uh, that are, you know, big global manufacturers like Ford, like GM, GE, Caterpillar, uh, when they make these large investments, they're not thinking, you know, we, oh, we would just want to go invest in India to be able to get the Indian market. They're thinking, how can we turn this uh, this market, this potential seller's market, but also this manufacturing opportunity into something that we can incorporate for the rest of the world? These issues are particularly sensitive around um, heightened periods of uh, political activity, which we're experiencing here in the U.S. leading up to the general election, of course. Um, but I think it's really important to remember what China's growth has done for the world economy. I mean, it really has powered the world economy. And, yeah, there's, there's a correlation when China slows down, the rest of the world seems to be concerned about a slowdown. So actually having India's economy power ahead and be able to accelerate at least 7, 8, 9% GDP growth that, that we're starting to see and is being forecast in medium term, I think is important for the globe. And I think that needs to be remembered into, in context. Uh, Michael, your comments on uh, India's role in, in, I suppose, the, the global economy right now, um, you know, it's a very fragile environment, isn't it? We've got major political uh, process going on here in the US, we've got Brexit potentially um, uh, having a huge impact in, in, uh, in Europe in the next few weeks. Brazil is on its knees after being one of the rising bricks. Russia's still languishing. South Africa's really struggling and just avoided a, a, a jump a, um, downgrade on its currency. Yeah, how important is it that India actually stands up and fulfills its full potential? It's extremely important, I think, for the global economy and I think for um, for, for, for companies to really look at uh, India as an opportunity for growth in their business, not only from the um, from kind of the consumer, the you know 1.3 billion, but a lot of companies you're seeing basing basing their R and D in India um, because the global market uh, so much of so much of R and D and development has been focused on the European market on the uh, U S market. Um, and I think over the next 10, 20 years, you're going to see a lot of focus on, you know, the 400 million people without electricity in India. And how do you, how do you retrofit your current products to be able to be marketable to these, you know, to this section of the population? Um, so I think, you know, India's role is, is going to be really important in terms of, you know, diversification and, um, balancing out uh, growth across the globe, but also from a you know product delivery standpoint, I think it's going to be important for companies to really look at India as a, a case study of sorts to be able to um, be competitive with the ups and downs of economies. I think that's a good point. The fact that you know, Adrian, you're right that there are there seems like there's a global slowdown in, in many parts of the world, and there's. There's a lot of countries that are <clears throat> struggling to keep their economy 
on track and there's political discourse happening around the world. And so it is a good time for India to be um, coming to the fore and showing um, that they are a, an area for growth. But what's really important to recognize is that uh, companies aren't making particularly large, high-tech, high-value manufacturing decisions based on the whims of, of today's economy. What, what's going to be really important for India over the next couple of years is for them to be able to straight that this isn't just something that they're um, able to take advantage of for the short term, but they're actually making those structural, making those infrastructure reforms uh, that are required to make them a long-term global player. I'd like to give a, an example of one of our clients who we helped uh, out of Detroit, a medium-sized company. They supply into Ford dealerships, and when Ford accelerated their dealership program a couple of years ago, they invited this company in Detroit to participate. And they did, and they started with baby steps, and we helped them get established with some people on the ground via our launchpad program. And uh, they've successfully delivered into Ford and started pitching to other local uh, car suppliers and pitched to um, the Japanese um, uh, auto giant Toyota, won a deal in, in India to support Toyota's auto dealerships, and that deal has now just gone global as of a couple of months ago. And that will create a number of jobs into Detroit. Of course, the profitability of those deals will go back to Detroit. And uh, you know, that's exactly what it can mean in context for some of these small and, and medium suppliers. Uh, we've got about seven or eight minutes left, so to avoid running out of time, I just want to uh, start beginning the wrap up. And uh, we've got one more question that's come in um, uh, on our screen here which uh, I'd like to address to you, Brandon. It's about um, defense relationship between US and India. Um, I certainly saw um, uh, during this trip a uh, further commitment to the relationship. We all know about the counterbalance that the US wants India to play in the Asian region. Um, huge uh, game of foot amongst the, the Indian uh, procurement division and, and mm -hmm. the US um, defense suppliers. And that gets a lot of air time at the U.S. India Business Council yeah. and in joint discussions here. How has that moved forward during Modi's visit? I think it's moved forward well. It certainly was. You know, our discussion today was um, highly focused on on the commercial aspect of what's going on. But certainly, um, there will be discussions around town for the I'm sure the next weeks and months to come about all the implications of the strategic discussions and the dialogue that they've had over the the course of last week. Um, I think very significantly uh, and, and at, at the highest level, seeing that um, the U.S. Uh, government and, and the U.S. India Business Council, I think uh, most people that are deeply involved in this relationship support um, an increased role for India in the world uh, globally. So you see that in, in the U.S.'s support for global for um, India to take a bigger role in global governance and the U.N. Security Council. Um, that was reaffirmed in the joint statement but also showing that you know, we are trying to advance um, greater technology transfer in the, in the defense space, make it easier for US companies to, that are in manufacturing defense products to get into India and to do business with the Indian government. So I definitely think there's move forward on that. I think that it's something that, um, whether it's a counterbalance to China or just a, a way of us recognizing um, India's uh, increasingly uh, important role in the world and trying to embrace that, um, absolutely, it's it's moving forward. Good. Okay. Michael, any other commentary? Uh, no. I mean, before we sign off, I'd like to do a kind of what's next, what we're focusing on next. But uh, in terms of the uh, on the defense side of things, you you had the big DTTI, which I think was uh, announced uh, in 2015 when Obama came mm -hmm. uh, to India, and now what you're seeing is that being segmented down into different working groups, so the naval systems working group, air systems working group, and weapon, weapon systems working groups. And when these high-level dialogues actually get broken down into these subsections, that's when I think you really start to see progress being made, um, deals being done, because you're, you're kind of sh sifting through the, the, the high-level stuff and getting down to the actual nitty-gritty of getting deals done. Okay, good. Brandon, any other opportunities you wanted to cover? I guess what I would cover um, would be would be cybersecurity. It was great to see cybersecurity on the agenda on the on the um, the joint statement. Um, you know that we obviously very very much welcome uh, increased collaboration on cybersecurity, um, both on on the strategic and, and security side, but also for for companies doing business both here and and in India. You know we've seen so many of these high profile um, cyber breaches. 
Um, it's an increasingly complex and difficult issue with a lot of players and a lot of very intelligent um, folks on both sides. So um, I think that the U.S. and India uh, really could use each other's support uh, moving forward on cyber issues. Good. Good. Okay, well, I think the focus now as far as the policymakers is uh, going to be on New Delhi. The strategic and commercial dialogue will take place there. Um, we're led to believe somewhere around the end of August, um, dates I think to, to be confirmed. Uh, and that will really put a lot of these discussions into policy and really enable um, some of the initiatives to, to, to move that step further. And further. But for the mechanisms to be such that the funds that are being talked about in many of these meetings between the heads of state to actually you know, be implemented and move forward. But certainly from where I sit, um, I've been here in, in the US now for uh, just under a month um, since we set up our US office. You know, I, I see a broadening interest in India. Um, certainly anyone that I've picked up the phone to or been in conversation with is you know, interested in the story, not just at that high level, but are asking the type of questions that say to me that, that, that people really want to engage uh, more actively. I think the US has got a long way to go to catch up some of the structures that maybe the, the Germans and the Japanese have set up to support the supply, their supply chains going in when their big multinationals go into India. And I know we're all working very hard um, on that, particularly with the US Business Center's initiative. But you know, I feel very optimistic um, about what's ahead of us now. I think that Prime Minister Modi and Obama have found a, uh, a very good groove. They've got a great relationship. There is an offer extended by uh, Prime Minister Modi for uh, President Obama to go out one more time before uh, he finishes office. Whether that will be possible or not, I don't know, but I'm sure he'll try his best. Um, but certainly, um, you know, a great platform has been established. Um, we certainly see that uh, doing business in India has become easier. So a huge distance to go before it rates with um, some of its other Asian neighbors, such as Singapore and Hong Kong and others. Um, but there is really a, a, a recognition now that the opportunities that have long been talked about in India are coming to fruition. Certainly under the Modi government, we're seeing the, um, the wider federal states get involved. Um, we're seeing businesses more actively en en engaged. And certainly here in the US, there's a willingness and a support and an increasing number of platforms that uh, are opening their arms and providing a safe and steady route into the Indian market. So from Brandon at USIBC, thank you very much for, for, for attending and giving your views, for, uh, both personally and from the council. Michael at San Andreas Fall, great to have you as ever. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, dialing into this webinar. Please follow our website, www.sanamesfor.com and www.usbusinesscenters.com uh, for future webinars on India, Brazil, China, and the UAE. Thank you very much for all of us. Have a great week. Thank you.